Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to the Michael Dresser Show. There's no topic this program is afraid to address or investigate, whether it be social, political, or current events, including some very sensitive cultural issues of today. The views expressed by the host, guests, and callers do not necessarily reflect the views of this station. Now, step into the realm of clarity with your host, Michael Dresser. And uh, we are almost in solid. We love those guys. Stance Morris with us, the author of Systematic Magic, Seven Keys to Disinfy Your Business, I'll Service, I'll Thank, I'll Market Your, com- uh, your com- Competition in the Economy. Uh, from Disney Manager to Carpet Queen uh, to Business Strategist, Vance is the author of Home Living Books, The Eastern Shore Guide to Healthy Indoor Living, How to Preserve the Value of Your Oriental Rug, and The Pet Owner's Guide to Carpet Cleaning. That must have sold $100 million. He's also authored the business book, Seven Rules for Parity in Any Economy, and the forthcoming book, Systematic Magic. Uh, Vince is the, Vance is the owner of Chem Dry on the Shore on Eastern Shore Cleaning Company. He's also the founder of Deliver, a Deliver Service Now, a Disney service and marketing consulting business. And let's say, Vance, I welcome to the show. I appreciate it, Michael. Thank you very much for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. I, I think the book on the pet carpet cleaning had to sell billions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, very popular. Uh, the, uh, the, the first print, I mean, I use it primarily for, uh, for lead generation and for uh, you know, in, in informing and educating, uh, you know, our clients on <laughs> the, the, the damage that pets can do. Um, so it was kind of a freebie, but uh, it, it was so popular that uh, the first hundred were gone in, in, in less than seven weeks once I once I had it out there. So I actually started selling it after I finished giving away the first hundred. Oh, my goodness. I mean, you know, the, the title in and of itself would probably get a lot of people's attention. But let me ask you something. You know, the word, and let's tie into this word of systematic. And I think it's very, it's a very important word because anything that will get you someplace is a process. It doesn't automatically happen. It's step by step and it's systematic. What was it for you when you sat back and you realized that it is systematic? There are keys to get certain places. Where was it for you that you actually caught this? Well, you know, was, uh, back in my days at, at Disney, um, you know, we studied quite a bit about, you know, how we create the magic um, at Disney. And uh, as you and I both know, there's no such thing as magic. Um, I hate to break your, your listeners' hearts about that, um, but all a magician is doing is a set of practiced uh, hand movements, eye movements um, to create an illusion. Um, and that's all it is. And that's similar to, you know, people always ask, well, how did you create the magic at Disney? I mean, you guys doing, you know, getting dusted with pixie dust before you get out. And, and no, it is all practiced systems, practiced scripts uh, that allow us to consistently create um, a phenomenal experience for people. So I really got that drilled into me, uh, you know, back in my days, uh, days at Disney. And it stuck with me. And as I grew with my other businesses or with companies that I worked for, the key thing, the thing that made it the easiest for me uh, to manage employees, create great experiences for guests, was the implementation of systems, the review of systems, and then, you know, the the improvement or changing of of systems that were uh, in place. Okay, let me me, uh, take the word magic a step farther. I totally and completely believe, Vance, that there's magic out there. Disney did magic, not in the strategies, not in the movies, not in the characters, but with the audience, where the audience walked away, living part of what was going on, uh, the changing in, in certain ways, seeing things in a way that they would never see it. And sometimes the shift in the way they thought about something is totally magic because it took something from nothing to create a whole new world of perspective of how they looked at life. I, I, I completely agree with you, and, and it's you know, it was what we call a magical experience. Um, yeah. The transformation, you know, the 
the the wonderment, the wow of, you know, meeting one of the Disney characters for the first time, you know, the, and this is one of the things we trained with, with the characters was, you know, when you first meet a child, they have to, you have to understand that that child has grown up with you, watching you on TV, buying your stuffed animal for his entire life. So this kid has known you for 8, 10, 15 years, and his first meeting with you has got to be a magical experience. So we sure. practice that to get that point across. No, absolutely no question about it, because when you really come down to it, I want to go back to systematic approach, magic, whatever the case may be, and practice, practice, practice. And more importantly, the way that you use the word experience. It's got to be able to experience something out of, quote, unquote, the ordinary. And, and one of the ways that we do that is a recognizable something within what it is that we're watching that we associate uh, about something in our own life. Because when we see it and we become part of it, then it becomes an experience. I, I completely agree with you. And, you know, I carried this through to my carpet cleaning business, um, which in and of itself, you know, carpet cleaners don't exactly have the best reputation um, for uh, in-home service businesses. Um, yeah. And I wanted to make sure that what we did separated uh, my business from the rest of the, the folks uh, in my area. And yeah. one of the things that everybody has to do is go up and knock on the door and be asked to be let in. And I said, well, you know, that is just a mundane thing that has to, it, it, it has to occur. Why not make an experience out of it? So my guys know where to park. They carry extra uniforms with them to make sure that they are crisp and clean when they walk up. They have the red carpet that they lay down on the front porch, the little booties that they put on, a little gift in their hands to give to the homeowner. My guys knock on the door because salespeople and strangers ring the bell. Friends knock. Um, and then we wait for the door to be answered. We ask, you know, ma'am, you know, my name is Jeff. I'm here to clean your carpets today. May I come in? And asking permission to do that. And then when we do, we make a big deal of wiping our feet um, on the carpet, even though we know we're going to be putting the little booties on. And it's a show. We set the stage immediately uh, that this experience in your home, this experience is going to be like nothing you've ever uh, had before. And what you've given the the, uh, the consumer is an identity. You know, in today's world, we run around with people, go, go in any market and, and look at the person behind the uh, the checkout counter. They say, hello, how are you? Well, they're looking someplace else. You don't exist anymore. And with the technology that's going on, you don't exist anymore. But if you take the time to do this, all of a sudden, I, the consumer, the person on the other side of the door, I'm being respected. I'm being, I'm being acknowledged. I have an identity. And you're giving something to me that's way beyond the value of the discounted money. Uh, you, you know, you're so right. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I did an unintentional uh, customer service study uh, in my in my area. I happened to be at a uh, local hardware store, one of the big box chain stores, uh, purchasing some stuff to attempt to do some home repairs. Um, and while I was standing in line waiting, I noticed that the contractor or the uh, the cashier. Uh, was not uh, speaking to anybody that was in line. Uh, literally, they the first three people that were ahead of me that went through had wordless transactions with the cashier. And this cashier had yeah. plenty of opportunities to say something, but said nothing. Um, I got When it was my turn, I was with that cashier for three minutes, not, I, and I made it a point not to be the first person to say something. And lo and yeah. behold, I went out of there with no words exchanged at all. Um, and I studied that for the next few trips that I had to do, and five out of the nine places that I went that day, whether it was my a, a local sandwich shop, uh, you know, a couple of the stores or the bank, five of the nine, I got no verbal anything. Nothing. Yeah. Wor completely wordless <laughs> transactions. And, you know, I went back and I looked at their stock performance, and four of the five that didn't do the wordless, uh, that did the wordless transactions, their stock performance has been down over the last 12 months. I wonder yeah. why. Yeah, by, by the way, I did a quick story. Uh, I was in the gym about a year or so ago, and I walked over to the counter. I was looking for some protein powder. And the young woman behind the counter, 18, 20 years old at the most, and I said, do you have any protein powder? She said, no. I said, do you get any? She said, probably not, but you can go to the website. I said, okay, well, what's your website? 
She said, oh, no, no, go to the manufacturer's website. I said, why would I want to go to the manufacturer's website? Because she said, because if you buy it on ours, all they'll do is make a profit. That's a mindset. Nice. Wow. That was a true story. I, and I, I talked to the owner about that. Not, I didn't say exactly what it was. But if that's who you've got representing you, and we wonder why business in and of itself today is hurting, well, guess what? You know, and everything you're saying really costs people money because it's not the product. You know, and you sold more than a product, obviously, and, and most people don't get that. No, they don't. And it's, um, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, even when you bring it up, you know, they say, oh, that's not happening in my business. Um, and I did some tests with uh, some uh, some dentists, and I actually uh, had a few of them in the room, and uh, I had calls from, you know, the mystery shopper calls to their office. I said, okay, I'm just going to pick one and play it. It was absolutely horrendous. Um, and I looked at the rest of the dentists, and I said, do you want me to play any more? And they all just kind of <laughs> sunk in their chairs and said, no, we get your point. New. Yeah. You know, Vance, uh, the one other thing to, just to... Uh, uh, to, exe- to exemplify the point, then we'll go on with this. Um, I go into businesses back and forth. You know, they'll bring me in to do certain things. And last November, I went into a business, and they owned the building, and there was uh, divisions there in the building, and they had three, 400 agents all over the country. And so I started out with the first division, the guys on the firing line who actually picked up the phone and called a prospective client cold within a particular industry. So I walked in, I said, you guys got a pitch? And they said, sure. I said, can I hear it? They said, yes. So one of the guys, you know, he took that, that basic pitch and he went on for about 30 seconds and I stopped him. And they said, okay, hold on for a second. And I walked outside, went over to the reception area, got the receptionist and they said, would you help me? She said, yes. I said, thank you. So she followed me into the conference room. Now, I didn't say do it to her. I just said, um, uh, oh no, I didn't say pitch her. I just said, do it to her. And the guy did it for the 30 seconds, and I stopped him, and I looked at her, and I said, and I swear to God, Vance, I said, what did he just say? And she said, I don't know. And uh, I did that for three or four different divisions. Same thing, I don't know. The communication between the, uh, the, the salespeople and the consumers or even the people who are behind the counter is horrible. They need some training. Yep, and and it is, and it's you know it, a lot of it is, and you know slothful, uh, lazy uh, managers, uh, in, or even you know business owners. They just think that they should throw it out there and it'll work, and that's sorely not the case. Yeah, see, and when it really comes down to it, you know uh, the, the fourth talking point here I think is very important: uh, tenacity, personal uh, initiative. Uh, from the life to the near death of your wife to bankruptcy to financial freedom, you got to love the entrepreneurial roller coaster. you got to love it. you got to become part of it. And if those people in those different businesses felt engaged and part of the operation of that business, not necessarily you know a profit-oriented percentage, but if they felt part of it, if they felt that uh, their decisions, what they had to say, was part and parcel of the business being successful, you get a whole new operation there. Uh, completely, and you know, one of the the ways that we ensured that engagement uh, at Disney, and I again used that throughout my career after I left Disney. Which, by the way, people do leave there. Um, I get that question <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah, yeah, but uh, they we take that the the team approach, but it's not just you know uh, words that we're saying. It, it's not you know just a, a a book covering. It's you know we literally each individual piece of the team, whether it be the bus boys, the, the, the musicians, um, anybody who's got a stake in the operation of that particular unit, and we put them together. And, you know, the bus boys literally design their service specification. We tell them the goal. We tell them the expectation. But then they design how they're going to operate in that restaurant or in that attraction, um, and, and they write it out. And quite frankly, they do a heck of a lot better job than any of the managers. Um, and once they have that piece and part put together, they now feel a part of it. I mean, that's how Disney gets, you know, especially in, in Orlando, there's probably 70,000 employees just at, uh, at the park in Orlando. Uh, you know, sure. you don't get the feeling you're a number there. You get the feeling that you are part of an organization 
that is continually evolving, continually getting better, and you know values uh, the input of its employees. You know, when you come down to it, I think a prime example of what you're talking about, and it doesn't necessarily mean that Disney's like this. I don't know, but the uh, that Tom Hanks movie that was out last year or so about Disney and the movie. Oh yeah, did you see it? Yeah, Saving Mr. Um, Banks, wonderful movie. That's it. Yes, yes, yes. Was that anything like what Disney was like? A lot of it, you know. I mean, obviously, I'm not old enough to have known uh, Walt yeah. personally, um, but you know, I've read many of the uh, the biographies about him, and you know, he was. I, I think Tom softened him a little bit. Um, yeah. You know, every. It, I mean, he was a very driven man, um, and you know, it was, and you know, similar to you know, story to myself. You know, very tenacious. Was not going to give up. I mean, he suffered you know, a bankruptcy when he was in Missouri. Uh, you know, his first business yeah. went belly up. And, you know, he, he made for, for the coast of California. He knew exactly what he was going to do. Um, and I think that, you know, that story was a little bit more about, you know, the Mary Poppins story than it was more sure. about how Disney worked. But, oh, yeah, um, you know, Tom. Well, but let's, Tom take it, yes, let's, 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 let's take it at a little deeper level, okay? Because everything that you've said so far, that's what the movie said. Uh Basically, Hanks portrayed Disney in a certain way, whatever that was, but he had an understanding. He took the time. He knew what the audience wanted, whereby she didn't. Exactly. And if, if it would have been done the way she did, it, it would have killed him. But it's basically what you're talking about, engagement, caring, the wow factor, the something that's going to be different and something that everybody can relate to. Yep. And Disney did that, you know, from the get-go, when he started to make yeah. feature-length a uh, animation, um, you know, all of the movie heads uh, and distributors were saying, nobody's going to sit around and watch a full-length uh, animated cartoon. Uh, well, obviously, he's proved them all wrong. Um, sure. But, you know, he knew what he wanted, and, you know, come heck or high water, he was going to get it. No question about it, because when you really come down to it, everything that you've said is the base of any successful business. And think about that in a relationship too. If you're not even in business, it's all the same. It is a strategy. It's systematic. You've got to be able to uh, define your destination. You've got to get a picture of what it is, you know, what's it look like when you're going to get there, and then it's practice, practice, practice till you get there. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and it's, I think it's called uh, being a human being. But there's so many people who don't know. You know, thank goodness there's guys like yourself out there right now that are saying this that will remind people that they're not a cell phone and they're not a text. You know, you got to get back to basics if you want to be successful. And they wonder why they're having problems today. Well, you know, and that is one of the things, you know, I, I wrote about this recently in an article, um, you know, about how there is no easy button. Uh, worst thing Staples ever did for the business world was come up with that darn easy button. Because there's nothing easy. Yeah. That's, why, that's why they call it work. Um, sure. You know, and these and these guys that espouse and write books about four-hour work weeks or you know two-hour work months. Um, yeah, I, I have a hard time believing that they are actually only working four hours a week uh, just to write the oh, book. Yeah. They had to have worked a heck of a lot more. Um, That's even if they, even if they were, but what's the purpose in it? I mean, what you what value but, are you going to have? I was like, what the work now I'm done. What do I do now? Exactly. You know, and I think yeah. a lot of business owners um, and entrepreneurs also miss out where they they have an excuse of there are no resources, um, and yeah. they miss out on the point between resources and being resourceful. A very, even though it's the same root word, very different meanings in both of those words. And, you know, money Absolutely. is a resource. Time is a resource. Yeah. Uh, you know, employees are a resource, and they all have these, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough money. And they continue to make excuses why things don't get done, as opposed to being resourceful and using what they have in front of you. Um, you know, the, the Kenneth Cole story, I'm, I don't know if you've uh, read the, uh, the Kenneth Cole um, uh, women's goods uh, story, but um, no. you know, how, he got star well, how he got started, great ta uh, coffee table book, by the way, uh, Kenneth Cole story, um, you know, he wanted, his, when he first came out with his line of shoes uh, and handbags for women, I mean, very high-end stuff, he couldn't afford to go to the big show uh, in downtown Manhattan in New York City and, and present his products. He couldn't afford the show. Well, some people would say, eh, 
No money? No, no way I can do it. You know, guess we'll do it next year. Um, but not Michael, uh, or excuse me, um, uh, Mr. Cole. Yeah. He, he went and said, well, all right, let's, how are we going to do this? So he called up a friend and said, how does one park a 40-foot trailer in midtown Manhattan for three days? And the buddy said, well, you know, you really can't. Uh, the only people that they issue uh, tickets to, or excuse me, parking permits to for midtown Manhattan are the utility companies and movie theaters, or excuse me, movie production companies shooting full-length feature, feature films. Well, I don't know if the bells are going off yet, so what did he do? He went down and changed his name from Kenneth Cole, Kenneth Cole Link to Kenneth Cole Productions, slapped the 40-wide trailer you know, down uh, in midtown Manhattan, got Mayor Koch's finest policeman as doorman, put some Klieg lights out there, uh, you know, had a director, the red carpet and everything. Some of the cameras had film in them. Some of them didn't. Had a whole bunch of models. And he opened up right in front of the show with his, you know, shoe, uh, shoe mobile, for lack of a better word, um, with the resources that he had and just being resourceful. Um, so I, I, I always, refer to the, always refer to the Kenneth Cole story. I didn't do it justice in the few minutes we have on the interview, but uh, definitely something for people to take a look at and study. Harry, loud and clear. Best for just about our times. Let me ask you this: What site where we can find you and get the book? I'm sorry, Mike. What did you say? Oh, web, I'm sorry. Website we can find you and get the books. Certainly, uh, deliverservicenow.com. Um, that's deliverservicenow.com, and there is a link there where you can actually get the systematic uh, magic uh, report, and also a link there for uh, my book, Seven Rules for Business Prosperity in Any Economy. Wonderful. Hey, Vance Morris, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me on. Take care. Bye-bye.